Hi everyone, welcome back. Um, in the previous video, we looked at how we can calculate gravitational potential energy changes in a uniform gravitational field, that is where the field strength is assumed to be constant at all locations. Um, however, we already know that depending on the distance that you are from an object, the gravitational field from that object is going to be different. Okay, so the question is, how are we to calculate the change in gravitational potential energy, which we usually do using um, mgh or mg delta h, but how are we supposed to do this if the value of g is changing? Okay, we don't can't just put it into a formula. You can't use something like m delta g delta h. That just doesn't work. Okay, um, we need some other way to do it. So that's our dot point. Analyze the use of gravitational fields to accelerate mass, including the change in gravitational potential energy from the area under a force distance graph. Okay, that's how we're going to do it. Area under a force distance graph or area under a field distance graph multiplied by mass. So two different graphs. One of them, you just have to work out the area and that's, that's your change in energy. The other one, you've got to work out the area and multiply it by a mass and that's your change in energy. Okay, let's see how those two situations sort themselves out. Okay, so um, you might remember from area of study three that we dealt with um, force versus distance graphs. Okay, so um, that generally pops up when we're talking about springs or elastic materials of some kind. And we talk about, you know, if we have a graph force versus compression or extension, usually for a spring of some kind, it's assumed to be linear. And um, if you wanted to work out how much energy is stored in the spring, when it's compressed by a certain distance, you'd work out the, the area of that graph up to that point. Okay, that's how much potential energy that particular spring would have. Okay, so the area between, uh, sorry, the area under a force versus distance graph, that tells you something about the energy of the um, system. Okay, either you're changing the energy to increase it, or if it's, um, you know, it depends on the situation. You might be increasing the energy or decreasing the energy, but we can work out the change in energy by looking at the area under that particular graph. Okay, and that's what we've got here in this picture. So this graph here shows how the force on a 10 kilogram object um, changes as it falls from a distance of, well, two times 10 to the seven meters to one times 10 to the seven meters. So from here to here. Okay, so this graph, the, the y-axis is talking about the force of gravity that's being applied to the object. And we've got a way to work that out. If we really wanted to, we could say, yep, the force is equal to uh, big G times M1 times M2 divided by R squared, and just plot that for all these different points, depending on the distance that you are from the center of the Earth. Okay, the only thing that's really changing here is R in the, uh, the, the denominator. Um, so what we've really got here is a graph of one over R squared uh, multiplied by G times M1 times M2. That's all. That's all it is. Okay. Um, now you say you want to work out the change in energy as it changes from this height to this height. Okay. So it's getting closer to the earth, which means its potential energy is decreasing and its kinetic energy would be increasing. Um, if you assume there was no sort of friction between like itself and the, the atmosphere or anything like that. Um, so all we've got to do is if we've been presented with a force versus distance graph, you just work out the area under here, okay? And you're going to be doing approximations, like you can break up the area into shapes, work out the shapes of each area, add it all together at the end. Um, and that's it. I mean, that's all it is, okay? So it's nothing crazy. You've got a force versus distance graph. You want to know the change in energy as it moves from one position to another. Look at the area, okay? The only problem is... It's not a nice area to calculate. You just have to break it up into shapes. All right, so let's do this question. Um, so the same graph as the previous slide. Using the graph, estimate the change in energy of the 10 kilogram meteor as it decreases in distance from two times 10 to the seven meters. So from here um, to one times 10 to the seven meters. So basically this purpley shaded area. 
Okay, so let's do that. Change in energy, we know, is equal to the area under a force versus distance graph. Um, how can we work out the area here? Well, I'm going to split it up into three shapes. I'm going to split it up into this rectangle here. I'm going to approximate that part as a triangle. And then I'm going to approximate that part as a um, trapezium. Okay, so we've got three areas to work out. So let's do that. Area of the rectangle, pretty easy. So length times width. Um, the length of this particular rectangle would be 20 because that's, well, let's say the height of the rectangle is 20 um, because that's what the scale changes as you go from there to there. Um, then you've got this triangle here. Oh, sorry, I haven't multiplied it by the, the, the width. So we've got the width of this particular rectangle as being, well, what's the distance from there to there in terms of the scale that we've got? We've got, well, from there to there is 1 times 10 to the 7. So half would be half times 1 times 10 to the 7, or 0 0.5 times 10 to the 7. There we go. That's the area of just that rectangle. But the area of the triangle is going to be half of that. So half times 20 times 0 0.5 times 10 to the 7. And the area of this trapezium, well, if we consider that A and B and that part there to be H, then we're going to have half times A plus B. Let's say A is 10 and B, well, that's just the height of the rectangle, so that's 20 times H, which we already know is 0 0.5 times 10 to the 7. There we go. Put all that into a calculator. Now, this is going to be just an approximation. Um, and hopefully I've typed it in correctly, so you can double check this yourself. I get around 2.25 times 10 to the 8 joules. There we go. That's how much our energy has changed. Okay, so if the, the meteor is, is losing height, um, it's decreasing its distance from Earth, then it's losing potential energy, and you can imagine that's going into speeding it up, into giving it kinetic energy. Cool, so that's pretty straightforward. Okay, the hardest part is making sure that you're getting your scale right and you're not multiplying the wrong numbers together. So don't get confused, you're not just multiplying 0 0.5 as that width of that rectangle, it's 0 0.5 times 10 to the seventh. Okay, also make sure your scales are in meters, make sure that's in newtons, not kilonewtons or anything weird like that. Okay, make sure you do all the appropriate conversions first before you try and work out the area. Cool. So that's a force versus distance graph. Straightforward, just find the area, that's your change in energy. Awesome. What else have we got? Oh, what's going on? Sorry, a bit frozen. Cool, okay, so related to your force distance graph, it looks very similar. It's the field strength versus distance graph. Okay, now in our previous force versus distance graph, come on, change slides, you stupid thing. All right, so the vertical axis was in force, in newtons, okay? Now the force that a particular object experiences is going to depend on the mass of that object, right? So you put a 10 kilogram object in a field that has a field strength of 9.8, the force that that object would experience is gonna be 10 times 9.8, or 98 newtons, okay? If you put a 100 kilogram, kilogram object in the same spot, it will experience 980 newtons of force. Okay, so the force that an object experiences depends on its own mass. However, for a field strength versus distance, um, the vertical axis is going to be the same, whether you're talking about a 10 kilogram object or a 100 kilogram object or a 1000 kilogram object because your force, uh, sorry, your field versus distance graph is only going to depend on the mass of the object that's exerting the field, okay? So it's got nothing to do with any objects that are in the field. It's all to do with the object that's exerting the field. So the, the field versus uh, distance graph of the Earth, well, there's only one graph 
okay? It is the field versus distance graph. However, for a force versus distance graph, you could have any type of force versus distance graph depending on the mass of the object that is in the field, okay? It's just due to the fact that, you know, one object exerts a very particular kind of field around it, okay? And that field only depends on the mass of that object that's exerting the field, okay? Now, if we're trying to find the change in energy by looking at the area under the graph, well, the area under a field versus distance graph, it doesn't really mean anything, okay? What the hell is field times distance? Um, however, if you multiply the field by mass, you get a force because mass times field is equal to force. So you could effectively change the vertical scale of your field versus distance graph by multiplying all the values on the vertical axis by a mass of some kind, okay? And it's gonna be the mass of the object that you're trying to calculate the change in energy of and turn it into a force versus distance graph. Or what you could do is just work out the area underneath first and then multiply that area by the mass of the object you're trying to calculate the change in energy for, okay? And that's the um, strategy we're gonna use in the next question, okay? So a graph shows field strength versus distance for Earth. Okay, notice the vertical axis is field strength, not force. And it says a satellite of mass 1,500 kilograms changes altitude according to the value shown in the graph. So we're assuming from here to here. Okay, um, so it's, let's assume it's going that way. It's decreasing its, its height. Now it says, assuming the satellite was initially traveling at a speed of 3.2 times 10 to the three meters per second, calculate its final velocity. All right, so there's a lot going on in this question. We need to unpack it, so it might take a little while. You've got a field strength versus distance graph. All right, the field strength versus distance graph, you can work out the area underneath. It's not gonna tell you anything, okay? However, if you multiply that area by the mass of the object that is changing its height, so multiply that area by 1,500, you would then have calculated the change in energy of this 1,500 kilogram object, okay? Using that change in energy, we can then talk about how much kinetic energy it has gained in moving from here to here. We can then add that kinetic energy to its initial kinetic energy, which we can work out using its initial speed. Then we can work out its final kinetic energy. And from that, we can work out its final velocity. Okay, so there's multiple parts to this problem. You have to have a little bit of sort of uh, foresight to see what you need to be doing in order to answer the question. Okay, but we start off by finding the area under the graph. Okay, that's straightforward. So again, we're gonna somehow sort of approximate this as some kind of shape. I'm going to approximate it as a trapezium again, All right? Um, approximating as a, as a trapezium, that's going to be a slightly um, underestimation of our uh, actual change in uh, energy because we're discounting sort of this area yeah, but it's just an approximation, okay? All these kinds of questions, they're all just approximation kind of questions. Um, generally in an exam or something like that, if you've got a question like this, they'll have a range of values which, which they'll accept an, as an answer, okay? So don't worry too much about finding an exact area. Anyway, um, area under this particular graph. So area, all right, it's a trapezium, so it's half times A plus B times the height. A, let's say, is this side here. So that's from there to there. That looks like it's gonna be around 4.5. So 4.5 plus B. So that height there, let's say, is 8.5 times the height of this trapezium. So that's from there to there. So look at the scale, that's six, that's seven, so that'd be 6.2, 6.4, 6.6, 6.8, that's 6.9, cool. And that one there, so that's 9.2, 9.4. So the height of this trapezium is 9.4 minus 6.9, 
2.5 times 10 to the 6. Okay, don't forget about that if there's one of those there, which there will be usually if you're talking about gravitational field. All right, um, that's it. That's the area of this thing. All right, so that's going to be equal to, let's do it. You should work along with me here. So 0 0.5 times 4.5 times 8, oh, sorry, plus 8.5 times 2.5 times 10 to the 6. And I get 1.625 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Okay. Um, it doesn't really have a, a unit. You just leave it like that for now. Okay. So. That's the area under the graph. Now, how do we get the change in energy out of this? Change in energy is equal to the area times the mass of the object that you are trying to work out the change in energy for. And this only applies to a field versus distance graph. If it was a force versus distance graph, you find the area and you stop. You don't multiply it by mass. You only multiply it by mass if it is a field versus distance graph. Very, very important. Do not confuse the two different types of graphs. Okay, so we found area, 1.625 times 10 to the 7 times the mass of this object, which is 1,500. And also, don't confuse this mass with the mass that is like the mass of the Earth. Okay, this is a field strength versus distance graph for the Earth. Don't confuse this mass here with the mass of the Earth. That's not the mass of the Earth. This is the mass of the object you're trying to find the change in energy for. Okay, so now that's out of my system. Um, let's go ahead and do that. I get around... 2.44 times 10 to the 10 joules. All right, cool. So we know how much energy has been changed. This is equal to a gain in kinetic energy. All right, gain in kinetic energy, which we can call delta EK. Cool, all right. Now, what's our actual question? Calculate the final velocity of this satellite. All right, now... Change in kinetic energy is equal to the final kinetic energy minus the initial kinetic energy, which means the final kinetic energy is equal to the change in kinetic energy plus the initial kinetic energy. So in order to work out the final velocity, we need to know the final kinetic energy, but in order to know the final kinetic energy, I need to know the initial kinetic energy. Okay, normally, if an object's starting from rest, that's zero. So that's why we can just assume that the kinetic energy is the change in kinetic energy. But not in this case, because it's already got some kinetic energy to begin with, because it's already traveling initially at this speed. So let's work out how much kinetic energy it has initially. So EI is equal to half mv squared, which is equal to half times 1,500 times... 3.2 times 10 to the 3 squared. And you get a value that's around 7.68 times 10 to the 9 joules. Cool. So that's its initial kinetic energy. We know the change in kinetic energy. We know how much it's gained. It's this 2.44 times 10 to the 10. So its final kinetic energy is equal to 2.44 times 10 to the 10 plus initial kinetic energy we just worked out seven come on lag 7.68 times 10 to the 9 which equals drum roll please 3.208 times 10 to the 10 joules here we go that's its final kinetic energy and then all you've got to do now is equate that value to half mv squared and solve for v. So doing that, we get v is equal to the square root of 2 times kinetic energy, 3.208. What am I doing? Times 10 to the 10 divided by the mass, which is 1,500. And you end up getting 6540 meters per second.
cool. And if you compare that, that's that's just around double what it was to begin with, right? That's 3.2 or 3,200 meters per second. That's 6,540 meters per second. Cool. Doesn't seem unreasonable, all right? You've, you've decreased your distance by quite a lot, so you've lost a lot of potential energy. You can assume that you've gained, you know, quite a bit of speed in doing so. Okay, so that's a long question. Um, good thing that's the only one we're going to be doing. So go back and review how we did it, okay? But the main thing is to understand the difference between a force versus distance graph and a field versus distance graph and the information you can get from those two graphs. So for a force versus distance graph, the area gives you straight away the change in potential energy, okay? Straight away, just work out the area, that's it. Stop and then move on, okay? Do not do anything to the area. The area under a field versus distance graph doesn't tell you anything straight away. But if you were to then multiply it by the mass of that object that is changing its height, then that would give you the potential energy change of that object. Okay, so don't confuse the two graphs. Really, really important. Okay, make sure you know what to do when you're given either of those two graphs. Force versus distance, find area and stop. Field versus distance, find the area, multiply by the mass, then stop, okay? And then you can work with finding velocities and things like that after you've worked out that energy. Cool, so that's it. That's it for all this energy change stuff. Um, so you might like to go and review those two questions. And there we go, that's the end of the video. So next time we're gonna talk about um, satellite motion and how we can apply gravitational fields in analyzing um, the periods of orbits and the speeds of orbits and things like that. Okay, I'll see you then.